We're going to be in Genesis 16, and so I'm going to invite you to turn there with me, and I'll invite you to stand with me in honor of God's Word. Now I'm going to read the verses that uh, we're going to tackle this morning. So let me, uh, let me re- start reading for you uh, Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife, Sarai, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. And he went into her, Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms. But when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. Father in heaven, we ask this morning that you would take this story that happened to real people in a real history and apply it to our lives as you see fit. There's principles here in this story that are important for us to hear. And only you, by the power of your Spirit, knows how to apply that to our lives and connect that to the new person in Christ that you've created in us. And so, Lord, I ask that you would do this great thing that only you can do. Touch our minds, our hearts, and do this work inside of us that's transforming our lives and renewing our minds into the image of of the Lord Jesus Christ. For this purpose, I ask that you might energize me with the gift of preaching and teaching this morning. And help me, Lord, this morning to be able to communicate truth in such a way that people can get it. So quicken my mind for this and quicken the mind of the listener to not be distracted by the cares of life by the things in the environment around us, but to be able to focus in the next few minutes upon the Word of God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I have entitled, as you can see, this message, The Tale of uh, Two Women. And as I noted last week, Uh, What surrounds this whole matter uh, before us is um, what's going on between Sarah and Hagar. And, of course, um, we, in this last week, saw um, essentially how Sarah goes after the problem in her own strength. And Abram stands by and allows her to do what she needs to do. And the issue here really is that of a God-fearing person manipulating the circumstances of their life so that the outcome would be what they would hope it would be. And in her case, I noted last week, she was a woman of faith, and I think she was trying to just help God fulfill His plans that he had already said to Abram and promises that he had already made. I think she believed in them. And remember last week, I noted that one of the reasons I said that 
is, is because of her uh, statement in her connection to the Lord in verse 2. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. And that word Lord there, that title, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, is emphasizing the self-existent uh, God who is a promise keeper and a prom- promise maker and a promise keeper. And so that is the, the, the title for God that connects the, the people of God, or in this case, the Hebrew people, to this covenant making and keeping God. And so I contend that she was a woman of faith and she wanted to see God's plans and purposes fulfilled. She was just frustrated with the time that it was taking to get all of it done. Now, uh, she comes up with the proposal. And the proposal is is that uh, Abram take her maid as a wife and have a child through her and then end up uh, adopting the child eventually so that she could have a family. And this is her way of solving, you might say, God's problem. And so we're going to pick up in verse 3 because we really only covered two verses last time we were together. And so now, in, in, as we turn to verse 3, I want you to notice uh, there's a time element here. Notice what it says. After Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband as his wife. Now, the pointing out of ten years in the land of Canaan introduces attention to the story. This is what's going on behind the scenes. If you compare this to Genesis 12, 4, where we find that Abram uh, was 75 years old when God originally called him, now it's 10 years has gone by. And there's this pressure after 10 years has gone by. And there's this tension in the story. So now Abram is 85 years old and Sarah is 75 years old. And you have to understand that's why this is here in verse 3. It's to help us to see what was motivating her. And I'd like you to consider a few reasons why this is an important thought. First of all, it helps us to understand the stress they were feeling knowing that their age was catching up to them. Because in a natural sense, old people don't have children. In the natural world, old people don't normally have children because their bodies stop functioning in a way that allows them to go through that process. And so the natural course of life is catching up to them and they're feeling this tension. It was bad enough when God first called them and he was 75 and she was 65. There's still hope that this might happen. Ten years has gone by. And their bodies are failing them. Secondly, the pressure was really on Abram. Sarai, she had given up all hope of becoming pregnant. She had finally resolved uh, in her own mind that this wasn't going to happen for her. This is why she... She wanted her handmaiden to be given to her husband. But there was still hope for him. But he's no young spring chicken. If something's going to happen, it's got to happen soon. And so the pressure was really on him. And thirdly, the comment of being in the land of Canaan for ten years is, I think, important. I think it's another factor in the pressure that they were feeling. Because God had promised them originally that he was taking them to a land that he was going to give them. So now they're in the land. They've been living there for 10 years. Okay, we have the land now. What do we need now after that? We need children. And so because they lived in the land of Canaan for 10 years, there's this expectation children must be coming soon. 
And so from their standpoint, uh, there is a lot of pressure on them that they're feeling in a natural sense to be, ha- to be able to fulfill uh, God's plan. I want you to try to imagine the pain of trying to have your first child after so many years have gone by and trying over and over and over and over and over and over again and never seeing it come to pass. I I remember a few years ago when I was in Nebraska, had a couple come uh, and they uh, wanted to be counseled by us. And one of the things that came out was the fact that uh, they couldn't have children on their own. And by this time, they were both in their, I'd say, the probably early to mid-50s. And um, they had adopted children of their own. And they were struggling with these adopted children as they became teenagers uh, because usually around that period of time, an adopted child begins to realize there's something different about them. And they can... Uh, uh, and adoptive parents don't quite sometimes know how to handle this. So they're, they're coming and they're telling me about their story. And their story was that when they got married, they thought they would have a, this big family. And then, lo and behold, uh, no pregnancy, no pregnancy, no pregnancy. They went on to tell me that they had spent well over $100,000 in trying to, to find ways... They become pregnant. Uh, They went through so much uh, trouble in in that period of time, years of going through all the processes that they could could to try to get pregnant, and it just never happened. And what was interesting was, here they were uh, some 20 years or more after all those events, And the pain was still real and raw for them, especially, especially the wife. Now, the husband, he had rationally kind of compartmentalized things, and he was able to sort of put that in the past. It it broke his heart that they couldn't have children, but he was moving on. She couldn't do that. She was emotionally connected and attached to this issue of not being able to have children. It was very different for her is a real loss as a woman not to have children and it was raw for her and this is this is something i've seen over and over again for people who desperately want children and can't produce them for themselves it causes them to grasp at almost any measure in order to get the kids that they would like. And in this case for Abram and Sarai, you need to realize that there is a tension and a pressure on them. They want to have children desperately. And this is where she's coming from. And her solution to the problem is is that she'll give Hagar to her husband because she's looking to fix this and she wants it taken care of. So this is what's happening for them. And the time element here, they were 10 years in the land, is an important issue. Now as I said last week, the Bible makes it clear that Sarai was a godly woman. She was a woman of great faith. She believed in the promises of God that were given to her husband. The Bible in the New Testament makes this very clear. But her faith at this point was a young faith, and you might say it was an immature faith. It hadn't matured fully yet. Because mature faith knows how to wait on God to fulfill His plans and His purposes. Immature faith doesn't know how to wait and be still and watch God work. And so what she does is she uses the customs of her day to do the work of God. And that's what's happening here as this gets unpacked for us. So you have to understand that in their day, a wealthy woman 
who did not have any children and couldn't have children had a had a right a legal right to engage a servant with her husband so that they could produce children and that she could um, adopt those children it is interesting that archaeologists have found writings from uh, around the same time as abram and sarai lived and those writings demonstrate how the law provided specifically for these types of circumstances. And the point that I want to make here is this. There doesn't appear to be any devious thought about what Sarai is proposing to her husband in the sense that she was using the legal means at her disposal in her day to be able to solve her problem. And so there's nothing malicious in what she's presenting here. But it is a problem. It's a problem in the sense that she's using the world's means to solve God's problems. That's the problem. And she hasn't learned, as I said, to mature in her faith, to wait for God to deal with those issues and take care of those things that He has promised in His way and in His time. She wanted to help Him out. So she was looking to control the situation and this is this is what we're we're seeing in her as we're moving through the story she's becoming a dominant and controlling woman within her home because there's this situation that she's going to take care of when i thought about this i couldn't help but think about one woman who came to um, us for counseling And the reason that she came was because she had a husband and two adult sons, and they were avoiding her. And she didn't understand why. And and so as I sat and listened to her story, it became very evident that she was a dominating and controlling wife, mother, and grandmother. I mean, she was the kind of gal that was just going to take care of everyone's business and make sure everybody was doing what she thought was right. And so I, I listened to her, and uh, I, when she was finished, explained to her what I saw as the problem. And, uh, and the problem was that she was trying to do God's job for her family. She was trying to take God's place. And I, I encouraged her that she... She is not everyone's Jesus. And that as a, as a mother dominating and controlling your adult sons and your husband is just chasing them away from you. And so uh, when I told her that she's not everyone's Jesus, she kind of smirked at me with a smile and said to me something like this. She said, yeah, but shouldn't Jesus listen to a mother? And she started laughing and I laughed and um, the way she did it was comical. But she got what I was saying. She, she understood uh, where I was coming from. She, she had issues in her son's lives. The sons had problems. And she was going to step in and she was going to control everything that was going on. And she controlled her household. This is, uh, this is something that I've seen over and over again in my counseling practice. In fact, whenever I have um, a couple come in and a woman is um, dominant and controlling, the first question I'm going to ask is this. What is she afraid of? Because nine times out of, a t- out of ten, the reason that a, a woman is dominating and controlling in this extreme fashion is because there's a fear in her life. And she's going to make sure that that fear never is realized in her life again. And so she's going to control and dominate everybody around her and everything around her to make sure that doesn't happen to her. Now, as I say stuff like this, I realize that in the culture that we live in, this is not something that is uh, uh, culturally acceptable to talk about like this. But you have to realize that I'm not saying that a woman can't be a dominating woman 
by nature. I have met some women who are dominating in their, in their nature because God has designed them to be that way. The problem becomes when you use your dominance in the wrong way and you can hurt people. For instance, if, if you dominate someone with high expectations, a person's going to be frustrated with, with you and with living with you. But if you dominate somebody, use your dominance, I should say, in, in a way that, in, um, that is accepting of people, a person's going to feel encouraged by your dominance. And, and so there's a right way and a wrong way to use these natural um, talents and abilities that God has given each of us. And, and so consequently, uh, those are, when we use those qualities in a right way, they are a benefit. And, and really, they're an extension of God's grace, an instrument of God's grace, if you were to put it that way. But if they're misused and used for the wrong reasons or come to the, the surface because of something like fear, then what ends up happening is, is you're going to start destroying everyone's life around you and you're going to feel the consequences of this. And it's not going to be a pleasant place to be. In fact, we can see this even in, in Sarah's life as we, as we move forward here in the fact that Hagar eventually runs from, from Sarah. Why? Because Sarah, Sarah was using her dominance plus anger in her life and that overwhelmed Hagar. And so she's overwhelmed and what does she do? She runs from the situation. And this, this then causes an issue for Sarah. And you can see, just it's like dominoes that begin to fall. And so Sarah's getting herself in trouble. And, her, and I, don't, I don't think she, she even realized it. I, I think she's blindsided by all of it. Especially as I consider her reaction to her servant. Uh, her servant's attitude. I, I, never, I don't think Sarah ever saw uh, it coming. And yet, uh, there it was. She's dominating the situation. She's going to fix it. She's going to take the bull by the horns. And she's going to make this thing happen. And the problem she had was that in doing so, her husband apparently emotionally detaches from her, isn't really involved, doesn't take an interest in her heart or her concern. He kind of just blows her off. And she's not getting what she really wants. But nevertheless, she's determined to take control of the situation. She gives Hagar to Abram as his wife. Now this is interesting. His wife. Calling her his wife makes the point that this is a legal arrangement. This, uh, this is something that, again, uh, was provided for in the law. And as such, when she becomes his wife, it's a legal binding marriage according to the custom of their day. In other words, Hagar wasn't just a concubine who was given to him for sexual pleasure, but a wife who's supposed to produce children for him. Now, as I said, this is a legal relationship which gives protections to Hagar. In the sense that uh, Sarai doesn't have the right to kill her, and she doesn't have the right to sell her because she's pregnant. And so Sarai has to keep her in the house because of these legal obligations that she has. She's protected, Hagar is protected by the law of the day. And as much as Sarah pushed for all of this, it didn't take long before she started feeling, I think, some buyer's remorse for what she did. Notice verse 4. It says, And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, 
her mistress was despised in her sight. Now we come to verses 5, 4 and 5. And here we've got Sarah's um, problem really coming to light. And we should not think of Hagar here as an innocent victim of all of this. From Hagar's standpoint, she was receiving something like a social standing promotion. She was a servant girl for one moment, and the next, she was a wife of a sheik. And not just any sheik. Uh, this was the man who had a reputation in the community as being an influential man. And we have to be careful when we look at a situation like this, not to lay on top of it our 21st century ideas of what is right and wrong in these types of situations. Because the culture that they lived in was very different. And contextually, the, uh, the perspective here is from their point of view, not from ours. Sarai wasn't taking advantage of Hagar in this situation. It, it was a common arrangement it was legal for the day. There's no indication that Sarah was oppressing Hagar in the situation to do what she was doing. Really, if Hagar played her cards right, she could have had a much better way of life as Abram's wife instead of Hagar's uh, servant. And that's hard for us to understand in the 21st century in our perspective of the world. But nevertheless, it's the way it was for them. Now, as I said, Sarah didn't anticipate Hagar's attitude towards her. I, I suspect that she thought that uh, Hagar was going to be appreciative of what she was doing in some way. But she wasn't. And uh, Hagar makes the mistake um, of thinking that um, things are going to change in the home. I think once she got pregnant, I think she thought she was going to be the hen that ran the hen house. And Sarah wasn't going to have any of it. And the reason I think that Hagar thought that was because in their culture, in their day that they lived, a woman who was barren was deeply disdained in her culture. Uh, and, and so there would be this social disdaining that uh, Sarai would have naturally had, but now she's got in her own home. So when, so when this servant looks at her with, the, with this disdain, it just flips a switch in her. She's going to have none of it. And it just torques her jaw that this servant wasn't sympathetic towards her, but thought herself to be superior through the whole matter. Now it's interesting that the Hebrew word for despised here is the same word translated curse over in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where God told Abram, I'll curse those who curse you. And, and it's the same word. And the word literally means to be small. Disdain means to be small, insignificant, unimportant, of little account. And this is the attitude that Hagar is showing towards her mistress. She was accounting to her of no value. Look, the look that one uh, might have. It's not hard to imagine. You ever had anybody look at you in that way, uh, look down on you? Ever had that happen to you? I've had that happen to me. It's a terrible look. And, and this, uh, you can just read what's on their mind. And I, and I think this is what's taking place. She looked down on Sarai as if she was inferior to her. And uh, this absolutely enraged Sarai. Now what makes the scene even more pungent, I think, is to understand the translation of the word mistress here. Because in our culture, when we use the word mistress, um, 
when we use the word mistress, we think of a woman who uh, is having an affair with a married man. That's what we think of, don't we? But that's not the, that's not the way the word is uh, translated. Well, that's interesting. I lost my spot. Let me find my spot here. Oh, here we go. So, mistress. It comes from a Hebrew word that in, that, is, that indicates a woman of high social position. Now, you want to note that. That's probably a good thing to put in the margins of your Bible so when you read that, you'll understand what that means. Okay? So, it is a woman of high social position. It's interesting that in 1 Kings 11.9, it's translated queen by the Revised Standard Bible. Queen. And the idea of Sarah being the mistress of the house clearly marks her as the most important woman in the house. And But now there's a servant who with her attitude is attacking her social position in her own home. In past decades in our own culture, we use terms like housewife or woman of the house to describe the woman who has the highest social standing in the home. And this is what's being presented here by using the word mistress. Sarah had the higher standard or, or higher social standard. She was of a higher rank. Than, than Hagar. And if you stop and think about it, imagine what it was must have been like for Sarai. And I keep calling her Sarah. I just realized that. And the reason is because her name gets changed here in just a little while as we go through the story. But you can try to imagine, or at least put yourself in her sandals, what it was like to live in a culture being 75 years old not having any children, and in that culture, you are despised for being barren. Now, she's got to live with this as she's moving about the area that she lives in. But now, she's got someone in her own home who's attacking her, and she's not going to have any of it. And on one hand, it's like, I don't blame her. In some ways, I think to myself, yeah, I think I'd tune Hagar up too. And just let her know who's in charge. But she takes it to an extreme. And this becomes a problem. And so, she's going to solve the problem. And the way she solves the problem is found in the next verse. Look what it says. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but she saw that she had conceived and was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. How does she solve the problem? She goes to her husband and blames him. That's her, that's her answer to the problem. Now, now what's interesting in her argument is this, and you want to pay attention to this. She makes an appeal to the Lord. Notice that. May the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the covenant-making, covenant-keeping, active, self-existent one. She's appealing to this God who she loves and has faith in. And the appeal here is in regards to what's happening to her. But what's interesting in all of this is this. When she first presented her proposal, she never appealed to the Lord. She just determined she was going to do it. And she proves it by her own statement of complaint. Notice what she said. I gave my maid into your arms. Notice it wasn't God gave her into your arms. It was I gave my maid into your arms. See, her own words convictor of dominating and controlling the situation with no thought of what God wanted. 
At the time the proposal uh, was made, she didn't seem interested in what God thought. She just came up with the big idea and said, this is the way we need to go. She was going to control the situation and move full steam ahead. Now that things are not working out as well as she expected them to, she blames someone else for the problem. And that someone is her husband. Now this is the way of the flesh. And this is the way it's been from the very beginning. You'll remember that when Adam and Eve fell into sin and God called them into question, Adam blamed Eve for the problem and Eve blamed the serpent. This is what happens when we're working in the flesh and things don't work out to our expectations. Often in a marriage, one party will blame the other for the problems that they're having. And this is what she's doing. Now, her husband's no better than she is because he just stood by as all of this was taking place. You can't tell me that he didn't know what was going on between these two women. In fact, I would suggest that his passivity is what lit the fuse that caused the explosion for Sarai. You'll remember that last week I spoke about Abram's passivity in receiving Sarah's proposal. I gave you six reasons why Abram should have told her no when she made the proposal. Now we see something else in his passivity that indicates he's emotionally detached from his wife and uncaring for Hagar. Consider what we know this far about what we've read. Abram stood by as Hagar was given to him by Sarai. The Bible gives us no indication that he went after her. He just stood there while she gave her to him. He doesn't seem to have any interest really in her. He, 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 uh, he takes her to himself. She was given to him. And nothing is said about any emotional connection or care for her. There's no indication that he he cared for her in any way. And this is going to come out even in a bigger way later on when she has the son that she's pregnant with, Ishmael. And there's a problem between the son that Sarah has, Isaac, and Sarah wants to get rid of Ishmael and Hagar. So what what does Abraham do to solve the problem? He sends Hagar and his son out in the wilderness, and the only one he's really even caring about is his son. He's not even caring for her. So he's totally emotionally disconnected from her. And secondly, when he got uh, got her, he had sex with her, and she conceived. That's all the Bible says. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. That's it. A very straightforward statement implying there was no emotional connection whatsoever. He just wanted a child, and he was just using her as a means, a tool, to get what he wanted. And thirdly, when his wife confronts him with her anger because the servant girl is sporting an attitude toward her, he blows his wife off and her concerns and her hurt by telling her, you're made your own, do whatever you want with her. It's not my problem. That's in essence what he's saying. There's no no thought on his part to identify with Hagar as his wife, the one who's carrying his child, which would underscore his involvement, his his disinvolvement in, in the whole matter. To Abram, Hagar is just a maid he had sex with and nothing more. He simply pushes the problem off on Sarai by letting her do whatever she wants with Hagar. So on one hand, we have Sarai, who is a controlling wife who only wanted to use her maid to get the children she wanted. And on the other hand, you have an emotionally detached husband who gives his wife what she wants. And when she wasn't happy with what she got, she complained to her husband and he gave up his other wife, and the mother of his child with no concern for their well-being. Between Abram's passivity, Sarai's domination and control, and Hagar's attitude, we have a three-ring circus of of emotional conflict, and there's more to come. It's a mess. 
in this home because they decided to do God's work their way. Now we move to verse 6, and now we have Sarah's payback. It's interesting, in, in, in Proverbs 30, there's a verse that coincides with, these, with this verse. In Proverbs 30, verse 6, we read this. Under a slave, see, under a slave, when he becomes a king, oh, pardon me, I, I should read verse, uh, verse 5 to that. Let me look this up, because I had it written here. So Proverbs 30, there we go. Verse 22, actually I'll start at verse 1. Under three things the earth quakes, and under four it cannot bear up. Under a slave, when he becomes a king, and a fool when he is satisfied with food, under an unloved woman when she gets a husband, and a maidservant when she supplants her mistress. Now that's interesting, isn't it? The Proverbs writer is saying that the earth quakes. In other words, there's tremendous trouble when these things happen. And one of them is when a maid tries to supplant her mistress. Uh, when, when you read that, you have to wonder um, if the Proverbs writer maybe had Genesis 16.6 in mind. So Sarai treated her harshly and she fled from her presence. Now, it's interesting, the word harshly is a form of the verb that means afflict, mistreat, act badly towards someone. It's the same word, get this, the same word that's used in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11, which describes the Hebrew people being afflicted by the Egyptians. And when you take that thought and you bring that into Genesis 16 in what Sarai is doing she's afflicting Hagar and and there's a sense here of even violence in it because we know from the story of Exodus that this affliction that was brought upon the Hebrew people by the Egyptians was one of whipping excessive hard work labor and these sorts of things And it gives us some indication on the vengeance that Sarai is now taking on Hagar. And again, what's what's happening is, is you have this dominating woman who is angry and she's overwhelming her servant. And so the passage passage says that she fled from her uh, presence. Now the irony in all of this is this. What we have here is a Hebrew woman afflicting an Egyptian slave. And what you'll have in the near future, a couple of generations down the road, are Egyptians afflicting Hebrew slaves. And the picture just gets turned around. And this is what's ironic about this. Sarai was stuck. She could not sell Hagar legally because she was pregnant to Abram and she's carrying his child. And so by rights of the law, she had had to let her stay in the home because of her status. But one of the things that she lost was any sexual contact with Abram. She could have kept him. Once she got pregnant, uh, she could have kept her away from him and more than likely did that now there's two thoughts that come to my mind as i think about this first uh where is abram while all this mistreatment is going on again it emphasizes his passivity and emotional detachment from the whole situation hagar was carrying his child and one would think at least 
that there would be some sense in him that would come to Sarai and say, now look, she's pregnant with my child. And, and this was your big idea. <laughs> but there's none of this. She's not, he's not going to defend her at all. And, and so um, she, he is just standing by while Sarai is taking her revenge. Secondly, Sarai might have had the right of a slave owner to treat Hagar the way she did, but she was under a greater moral law because she had enjoyed the grace of God in her own life. It was by God's grace that he came to her uh, and her husband and, and called them to the place that they had with God to be the couple that would bring these descendants into the world that would eventually bring the Messiah and deal with who would deal with man's sin. She had been privileged to come along with Abram as God was working with him through the Abrahamic covenant and to be a part of all of that. And so because of her, her status with God, there should have been a grace that she should have shown towards her. And then on top of that, because of her social status, being the mistress of the house, and having this high place, this place is, I think, a, a moral obligation on her to be careful how she treats people. It doesn't give you a right because you have the status to treat people wrongly. It, I think the high status puts a greater responsibility on you to use that in a way that blesses people. Now, it's hard to do that when you're in your emotional pain, and I get that. But nevertheless, it's still real. And, and this, this situation that's taking place is extremely painful for everybody. Abram doesn't want to deal with it. Sarah's fed up with it and angry. Hagar can't stand the weight of it, and she runs. She runs. And what we're going to see next week is that God has compassion on the situation. And what's fascinating to me in all of this is the fact that God comes to Hagar's rescue, not to Abram and Sarai. He comes to the least of them, and He responds to that need. And it's going to be interesting to see what he says to her because in essence if you put it just in a nutshell it would be this go back home and sit under her authority wow but when he sends her back he sends her back with his promises and this now elevates her life and it's going to be interesting to see what she does so there that's what i have for you today and thus far all right let's pray Father, as we close our service today, um, it's interesting to look at these people's lives um, from so many years ago, literally thousands of years ago, and how applicable uh, their lives are to ours. I'm sure, Lord, as we, um, as we unpack uh, the 16th chapter to this point, there's some of us that can really identify with each party that is um, brought forward here. I, uh, I trust that the, that the Holy Spirit will, will help us by taking the Word of God and the testimonies of these saints and applying it to our lives today so that our faith would mature. That's one of the big issues here, I think, for us, Lord, is watching them mature in their faith gives us a bit of a barometer of where we're at in our faith. And we want to grow up. We don't, we don't want to stay little children in our faith. We want to be mature. And so, Lord, help us not to be critical of these people, but to use them 
as our forefathers of faith and foremother of faith to help us to know what not to do and what we ought to do. As we go through the normalcy of life and seek to walk with You. Bless us in this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.